Thank you so much, Mary Beth. Thank you so much, Mary Beth and Laura, for the invitation to be here. And not just that, for the invitation to spend time at the conference and to hear the sessions and to get to know some of you. What a pleasure it's been. I hadn't realized that I do look quite like my photograph. And so people <laughs> often say to me, oh, you're the speaker on Friday morning, but I'd much rather just have had a conversation with them uh, as two people interested in talking with one another. But I, I've appreciated the warmth, and I, I, I'm struck by the collegiality, by the warmth, by the interaction, by all the conversations that I see going on within the society. I think that points to a very strong, vibrant society. Just so many things that have uh, struck me. I wanted to say how delighted I am that there's a meeting in Vancouver for the first time in Canada, and that's, that's just great. Indeed, I have been involved in encouraging women into leadership, particularly in the sciences engineering, trades, and technology for what feels like many, many years now. And so I will be talking a little bit about some of the actions that we've taken. Because for me, what's important is that, first of all, we understand what are the reasons why it seems to be a little slow for women to be moving into leadership positions. And secondly, what can we do about it? And what are the practical actions and what's been shown to actually work? So. Without further ado, we're going to talk about crossing these boundaries. I keep thinking about this boundary of women in scholarly communication, scientific communication, must be quite deep because it's like so many of the other boundaries that we're trying to cross at the moment. It seems to be awfully hard to get over it. But well, I'll share with you some of the things that are going on. Uh, First of all, why is it important? Why are we even talking about this? And I'm so delighted that the society has, took an, an initiative last year to look at the demographics, because sometimes we don't even notice. And I was particularly interested in, in recognizing that there is a, a sense that speakers must be women and men. You know, I go to many scientific conferences, and I think, did they not even realize almost all of the speakers are men? And that's great, and they're very good speakers, but there needs to be a sense of role modeling of, yes, indeed, there are some women in the discipline as well. Here are the reasons why I think it's so important. I'm particularly committed to seeing an increase in the diversity of women in leadership roles. And you notice I'm usually saying people. And I, I mean, one of the things that has been shown recently is that when a, a society, an industry, an organization becomes concerned about gender diversity, they become much more sensitive to all kinds of diversity, to cultural, to ethnic. And that, for me, is tremendously important. It's that sensitivity that recognition, I need to understand more about the people that are working here so that I, I hear what they're saying, not what I think they're saying. Workplaces become inclusive and respectful. The, the huge push that one of the groups I work with has just now is called uh, towards a respectful and inclusive workplace. Doesn't that sound great? It's a lot easier to say than it is to make it happen. Because in some ways, it's a cultural change. And it's quite a systemic change. But that's the ideal. I think you probably know, I mean, we, we talk about it so often, that diversity brings an increase in creativity and innovation. I prefer the word creativity to innovation. But the, yeah, I'll talk about it later. I sometimes get ahead of myself, so I, I will talk a little bit more about that later. 
And I put this at the end, but it's still very important. There's a very strong business case for having diversity in the boardroom, in the management offices, in the executive suite. Because of the work that you did last year, there are numbers now of the percentages of women. And I mean, it's wonderful looking around here. There are lots of women. And indeed, that, there, there's, and I, I just put this slide up so that you can see where the numbers came from. Because we all know that statistics can be made to prove almost anything you want them to prove. But these numbers are, are the more I looked at them, the more they're similar. And I heard David Kidder say, uh, no, no, David Hume say on Wednesday evening at the mentorship session that in the UK, publishing has about 60% women. So this seems to be a pretty standard number, about 60% women in the publishing field overall. But look at the CEOs, about 30%. And the board chairs, about 20%. Now, to put that into perspective, that's, oh, I, let's show you this first of all. I was struck. Look at this. Here are the numbers of women, I don't know whether this will, yeah, it does, in information science. My goodness, 65%, and this is in university, 65% students. This is undergraduate and graduate. And about 30%, 36%, faculty. There seems to be this kind of number that is, is across the board. It's not just in the society or in the publishing industry. I put in here as well, uh, here's the overall figures of women in universities. So again, it reflects very similar kind of figures. And of course, agriculture and biological sciences, lots of women again, but again, few faculty. And of course, if you look at mathematics and the physical sciences, where I come from, this always makes me feel very guilty. We're not making much progress. And then if you look at the catalyst uh, figures, catalyst has done a wonderful job in North America of helping to provide us with figures. And this is women uh, CEOs. And as you can see, here's the problem I have. Oh yes, we, we did quite well, you know, way back when, but um, anyway, you can see, <laughs> we're not moving very far, very fast. Look at those top numbers at the moment, 4.8% in the top Fortune 500 companies. Long way to go. And then the last numbers, women in boards, 47%, and this is Canadian numbers, 47% women in the Canadian labor force. And if you go down, look at management, uh, senior officers, and, and 500, FP500 board directors, and so on, it just goes down and down. So that's just to put the, the numbers into some kind of context. So why? Why are women not moving through? Oh, my colleagues in the chemistry department at the University of Alberta, used to say to me, why are you so concerned about getting more women into chemistry? Look at all the numbers of students we have. Just give it time. Well, my response to them nowadays is, I'm white-haired, and I'm not patient anymore, and I'm not giving it time anymore. I want to change to happen fast. <laughs> oh, I hope that kind of enthusiasm for the change will make things happen. I'm sure it will. I'm an optimist, thank goodness. I can't be anything else. And so you'll hear that coming through as I go along, that I really believe things can change. So what I want to do is look at what are the reasons. And you know, it's interesting. There were a huge number of papers came out in the 80s. And an awful lot of initiatives started happening to get women into senior roles and, and even into uh, places like engineering where they're just not in any roles. But then there was a dearth. There wasn't a lot happening for about the last almost 30 years. 
And it's only in the last five to seven years there's been a flood of papers again, which is quite wonderful. So we've got some new understandings, some new statistics, and some new actions, which we're beginning to show that we can actually make a difference. So let's begin to look at this. I'm sure you're not surprised. There are underlying attitudes and stereotypes. And they're subconscious. So many of them are not ones we even recognize. And I'm going to talk a bit about the decisions and how they're affected by these unrecognized stereotypes. And of course, there are differences in male and female styles. Now, let me say right now, I'm going to almost make this sound dualistic, and it's not. But it, I have to make it dualistic because that's about the only way that I can explain it. You know, if I tried to talk about the, 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 the range, because this is a continuum. I know many women who are very strong leaders, who I might even say are aggressive. And I know some very nurturing men. But just to, to highlight the differences, I'm going to make it sound as if there's two ends of a spectrum. But please keep in mind, that's not what I mean at all. There's just a few more women at one end of the continuum and a few more men at the other end of the continuum. Otherwise, we're quite intermixed, thank goodness. That, again, is why I believe we can make a difference. Then, yeah, we're going to talk about the differences in styles. OK, these subconscious biases. They affect the expectations of women and men. I remember at a panel discussion of groups of faculty of husbands and wives who were both in, in the university. And we were asking them, how do you share uh, parental care? How do you share household duties? And I had to, to laugh. One couple said, oh, we do a lot of sharing. The husband makes the breakfast, and the wife makes the dinner. Now, I don't know about you, but there's a bit of a difference there. <laughs> But it was, the, it was the sense that they were getting over to us. Sure, we share. I'm delighted, of course, now that the grocery shopping, I think, is done just as much by men as by women. Right? <laughs> Perhaps the most important part of this are the systemic biases that we don't recognize that affect our decision making, our selection process, our performance evaluations. And there was a report that came out in 2012 done by Yale University. And many of my illustrations, of course, are connected to the sciences, but I know that many of you are involved in scientific publishing. They sent a resume out to 30 different universities. And it was a resume which would be appropriate for a technical manager in a laboratory. And of course, you could guess. Half of the resumes had the name Jennifer, and the other half had the name John. And they even chose these names very carefully. They, they, apparently, John and Jennifer we respond about the same way to those two names. And they asked the people that they sent them to, to rank the resumes out of seven. And it was not a very strong resume. And they also asked for the starting salary that this person would be offered. Well, you can guess. I wouldn't be telling you this story. But when they came back, even the researchers were dismayed. This is 2012, remember. Jennifer was given a ranking of 3.2 out of seven. John was giving a ranking of four out of seven for identical resumes. And it didn't matter whether it was women or men who were doing the ranking. Jennifer was offered a salary that was $3,700 less than John. Now, 
that for me was quite dismaying because when we started Wisest, I hate to think about it, but it was 35 years ago, we were talking about this. We were talking to teachers about how they gave different advice depending on whether it was a woman or a man. But to see this still happening today, and of course, Yale sent back the results to the, the people who had done the evaluations, and they were, they were amazed. They didn't realize they were doing it. I love telling stories, as you can probably guess. And I was shocked. One of my biases came out. We were organizing at the University of Alberta a meeting of the Canadian Society for Chemistry. And I was on the executive planning committee. And as the conference came closer, and I'm sure Mary Beth and Laura understand this, we decided we'd better meet every Saturday morning to pull together the final details. And each of us would take turn to bring muffins and coffee, and, and we could work then over breakfast. When it was the turn of the chair of the committee, who was a man, to bring the muffins and coffee. I'll never forget, he came in with a basket and it had a red and white checkered tablecloth in it, which he put on the table. And then the muffins that he brought were some of the best muffins I've ever tasted. Can you guess what I found myself thinking? You're not supposed to be good at this. That's what I'm good at. <laughs> I have never forgotten that. But it, it, these deep, biases that we don't even know we have. But the one I was talking about at Yale, which affects performance evaluations, can you imagine when a young woman comes in asking for a, a raise in pay, the minute she stands in front of the person she's talking to, there's, there's, a, 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 there's something against her. And we don't even realize it. And we certainly don't do it intentionally. And the effects are stronger where women are a minority. I think that uh, is, is, goes without saying. And for women in decision-making roles. So here we are again. The higher up you get, the more likely you are to be subject to these biases. And the small disadvantages accumulate. And we know that this is one of the reasons why women don't tend to go on up into the higher levels. Last year, I was asked by a big engineering firm on uh, Women's Day to talk about the past. That's the problem of having white hair. They ask you to talk about the past. They had somebody talking about the present and somebody talking about the future. This was a great exercise for me because it made me look and see how long is it since we've had very open biases. And you know, it's not all that long. 1952, US Federal Public Service said that married women could be employed, but those in charge of hiring could decide whether they wanted a man or a woman. In other words, at least for me, that implies it really didn't matter who was at the top of the the list, the selection list, if they wanted, if it was a woman and they wanted a man, it was okay to go to the next. And that was 1952. Well, that's quite a while ago. 1955, oh dear, look at this one. That was when restrictions on employment of married women in federal service in Canada were lifted. Now, th then there's a few more like that. Equal pay for equal work. In the US, that was 63, in Canada, 56. And then the, the last one here, 1977, Canadian Human Rights Act prohibits discrimination on grounds of sex in federal employment in Canada. And the Labour Code provides for maternity leave. 1977. Now, the reason for looking at this today, a lot of the people who are in decision-making roles today grew up with this kind of culture. And it's not surprising that this is still a kind of filters through into our culture even today. And I, you know, this, this picture of the woman serving and, and the man, the, those, they're awfully ingrained. It's quite hard to, to change it. 
although thank goodness it's changing. And of course you recognize Rosie the Riveter up there. I hope you recognize Rosie the Riveter. We can do it. So that's a bit wee bit about systemic biases. I'm hearing my Scottish accent. Sometimes when I get uh, very, very passionate about what I'm talking about, my, my Scottish accent comes through. So if I see people looking at as much as to say, what, what was she talking about? Then I'll, I'll try and translate it into something. Differences in male and female style as well. Um, communication. I find this a very interesting one. I, what I'm going to do is show you the, the, the differences, the, the, the topics that we're going to talk about, and then move on and talk a little bit about them. Difference in style and management, in risk tolerance, that's where David Ritter talked, and in self-confidence. And I love this. All the research has shown that there are no differences in science and math ability. No matter how deeply we believe as women that we're not good at math. That one, that for me is one of the hardest ones. We have a lot of students that we, and, and what we do is mentor them. We put them, let me back up, students in first year mathematics who decide, oh, it must be me. I just don't get this. So what we do is mentor them, pair them up with a young woman in either second or third year math, preferably with a young woman who also had difficulty in first year math and who can say to this new student, no, it's not you. It's okay. You'll do okay. It's just a tough course. Getting that message over is, is a great help. We found it really makes a difference. But it's extraordinary how difficult that perception is to change. And if your parents, please tell your children, your young girls, that they're good at math. That makes a big difference as well. If you, we, we, there's another study came out showing that young women who in, are in physics, and of course, again, there's a big connection here with math, uh, young women who are in physics, if somebody encouraged them in high school, in early university classes, and told them, my, you're doing well, the difference that made was huge. That's something for the society to think about, that the, the young women who are here, we have a real role in saying, what a great job you're doing. You, you should be looking at uh, a, a decision-making role. You should be looking at moving up. We need you. So let's just look at these. I love this cartoon. And I'm still amazed how many women identify with it. And, and often as I sit around a table with, with the dean and, and the group of us, and we're about 50-50 women, men. Well, we were. We're not anymore. Uh, anyway. <laughs> I, I think of this. And I, I come back to that continuum. There are women around that table who are very determined to make their point. I find it difficult to break in and say what I think in a way that makes people sit up and take notice. I'm much more likely to say, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I think. And you know, that doesn't carry the weight. But let me say this, and, and I'm going to, this again is, is a philosophy that I think is hugely important. I'm talking about the differences. But remember what I said earlier on, that it's diversity at the decision-making table that makes for greater creativity and innovation. If we all try to become the same, we lose the advantage of the diversity. And so for me, it's tremendously important that women and men keep their values. They do things the way that's comfortable for them to do. But I want the men to recognize that the women often have great ideas, but sometimes need to be encouraged to talk about these ideas and encouraged quite strongly 
sometimes. I, I notice particularly again with some of our young students who are brilliant, but you don't discover they're brilliant for quite a while until you begin to get to draw them out and get them to talk. And that there's a cultural difference there as well. Just, just think of the differences in communication of women and men. And this is one of the important things that we have to listen and understand what's being said, not how it's being said. What about management? In some ways, this is an easier one. Come back to these expectations, to, to the culture that we came from. Yeah, men lead. That's, that's the normal thing. Men are expected to be leaders. What are women expected to do? Support and nurture. At the moment, women still are the members of our population who have babies. So they have to be able to nurture. One of the things that I feel very strongly about is that we need to give men much more opportunity to develop the nurturing that's in them as well. And here's where I, I'm concerned. We'll talk a little bit about policy as we go along. Most institutions, most companies, most industries have very good policies on parental leave. They're not very well implemented. It's the women who take the parental leave much more often than the men. Although I'm seeing a difference. Oh, here's another story. Not too long ago, uh, two people who were spouses in one department in a university I was talking with them, and the woman had just had her second child, and this was a science department, not engineering, science. And she said to her husband, how would you like to take parental leave this time? He did not when she had her first child. And do you know what his response was? I would be laughed out of the department. Now that really was, is, is a reflection on what we expect. It's changing and it's not surprising to me that in our, our Department of Biological Sciences at the University, which is one of very, very large science departments, where we have quite a number of spouses working in the department, there is parental leave taken by both male and female. And what a difference that makes. I think this is something that we have to work at. And I think, in some ways, this would be a gift to our men. Because you have a chance to actually get to know your baby when they're still very young. And to develop, to, to all of us as human beings have a nurturing sense within us. And this allows the development of that nurturing sense. This is what I find oops, very encouraging. And I'm sure you're seeing it. And I suspect in the Society for Scholarly Publishing that this is happening faster than it's happening in other places. We talk about a hierarchical system against a more democratic system. And here we are again, you know, this duality. But men tend to prefer the more hierarchical, women tend to prefer the more democratic. However, it's being shown again, over and over again, that when the management system becomes more democratic, when the CEO realizes that maybe there's somebody in a team working on a project who knows what would be good for that project and goes and asks them, 
how this should be managed. How should the policies that we're putting in place at the top reflect what works well for you as a team manager? It seems obvious, but it doesn't always happen, and it hasn't always happened. Decisions tended to be made around the boardroom table of what was best for everybody without asking people. That's changing. And certainly, if you ask uh, young graduates, you get a very idealistic sense of what management should be like. Very democratic. I worry that as you go into the, your, your career, you get molded into something that's not quite as idealistic. But at least it's there. And I find this very encouraging. I look forward to a day when companies, and oh, here's my bias, particularly engineering companies, show a much more uh, democratic way of running their, their business. Risk tolerance. David Kidder talked yesterday morning about risk. Well, this is what the, the, the research shows, that women are indeed less willing to take risks, especially if they're going to affect a large number of people. Women are willing to take risks that affect themselves more than others. It's kind of an interesting one. And, but if it's a large number of people, you know what I like to wonder? If the Lehman brothers had been Lehman sisters, <laughs> what would have happened? <laughs> I've taken my share of risks. You have to. And there's many a night I've gone to bed and thought, what have I done now? And spent a sleepless night, and the next morning got up and said, okay, I've done it, now I have to make it work. And again, we heard David Kidder talk about how you make it work. You don't run out of money. And I know that many of the not-for-profits that, that we work with live on a knife edge, and we're always taking risks. But because we believe in what we're doing, and because we believe that there are people out there who are willing to support what we're doing, then we keep going. Self-confidence. This is another one that we... Oh, I want to talk a wee bit about this. It's, it's again, something that is constantly said. Women don't have quite the confidence of men. But, look at this, there's a fine line between being assertive and being aggressive. Um, if, if you raise your self-confidence, you tend to be a little more assertive. Here's another story. There's a woman called Suzanne West, and she has videos on YouTube. She is an engineer, and she is a model for me. I've heard her speak a few times at meetings that we have organized. She's in Calgary, so, and I'm from Edmonton, so it's, it's quite close, and we go and organize meetings quite a bit in Calgary. And the last meeting we were at, we were talking about self-confidence, and we were talking about women being more assertive. And she said something I will not forget. She talked about this fine line between being assertive and being aggressive. And she said she's even uncomfortable with assertiveness, but particularly with aggressiveness. I should tell you, she just started her, what, fourth company. She, she starts, uh, does a startup and then sells it and moves on and does another one. This one is called Imaginea, which I think tells you something about Suzanne West. She said, in her company, if she sees someone being more assertive or aggressive than she's comfortable with, she doesn't fire them. She asks herself, why is that person being aggressive, and what can I do to change it? I found that interesting. 
That's not the normal reaction to an aggressive employee. Why is that person being aggressive and what can I do to change it? I like that. And I don't always agree with everything Suzanne says, but boy, she makes me think. We have to learn to believe in ourselves and mentorship has a lot to do with that. And I, I will talk a little bit more about that later. We have to learn not to be afraid to fail. More and more, the literature is showing that that's when you really learn, when something doesn't work. And yet, at university, you are really told you must not fail because it's the end of your career if you do. So we get this mindset, failure is terrible. But, and it may be in, in passing an exam that it's pretty important to get not to fail. But it's totally different. If you're going to take a risk and try something, you may have to fail. And it may well be worth it because you'll learn an awful lot in that failure. Okay, now we get to the, we've looked at that why women are not moving forward. We come back to looking at why is it so important that we have them. And it, it's obvious, we all know about groupthink. And that has been a problem. Let me share with you, in Canada, we have a very high, as in the US, as in the UK, very high educational system. Our population is very highly educated. We feel that we do not have as much creative and innovative thinking as we would expect from this highly, highly educated population. And so we're looking at what are the reasons for that. And you know, we tend to squelch creativity in many ways. And this is one of the ways that we do it. We put a group of very similar people, be it women, be it men, be it one ethnic culture, around the table, and we let them make decisions. And that's not the best way of getting innovation. A diverse group more likely to generate creative ideas. And I think that's what we're all looking for. Why, how can we move forward creatively? What's going to benefit the next generation? And devising more robust solutions to problems. So it's not the first solution that we come up with, which may build a very good bridge, but it's a robust solution, where, which builds a really practical bridge that's going to last for a long time and serve the people who are going to cross it. This I love. I was so pleased when I saw this. This is um, from the Harvard Business Review. Look what it says. Diversity. Higher collective intelligence. Don't you love that? Isn't that what we're looking for? I, I'm always a little embarrassed in showing this. Notice the line. This is a group of people solving a problem, and you can see that there were many, many groups that they looked at. This is social science research. And so these bars are large because the errors are, are quite large. This is groups of all men solving problems. <laughs> this is groups of all women solving problems. But here is 50-50. And so I think, although it looks here as if the women are slightly more high, slightly higher collective intelligence as a group than the men. And I'm sure there are all sorts of questions being asked about why that should be so. There's no question that the mixed group in general has a very much higher chance of coming up with a higher collective intelligence. Oh my, how much would our society benefit if we took advantage of this all the time. I think you know or have seen the business case. It's, it's a very strong business case and most grateful again to Catalyst 
who, has, who have come up with all these figures. These ones are from 2007 because it can be kind of difficult sometimes to get the most recent figures. But you'll notice return on equity, return on sales, return on invested capital, considerably greater between the lower quartile of companies with women and the higher quartile of companies with women. And then the other one, which is a very interesting one, the philanthropic givings of companies with women on boards increases dramatically from uh, the, the zero women directors giving about a million dollars to three or more women directors giving $27 million. It really is an enormous difference. Again, interesting to think about what the reasons for that are. Okay, now we get to the bit where, okay, what we can do. Now we know some of the reasons why there are problems, why, what the issues are. What can we do about it? And I wanted to share this with you. I, um, the, the, the project I have at the University of Alberta just now is called Project Catalyst. And I show you this because, first thing there, sitting on selection committees. Remember I said that the biases, the, the subconscious biases that we have affect our selection. Let me give you one example. We had uh, a job opening this year for a faculty member in computing science. And we got a huge number of applications and we worked very hard to get women to apply. That's step one. And we were quite successful, there were a lot of women. When we came to look at the resumes and the, the CVs, the selection committee looks, of course, at numbers of papers, and that's important. We are, after all, publish or perish uh, at university. But they were also looking at citations. And I was getting a wee bit concerned. This is awfully statistical. And I like to look at the person and how they'll fit into the department and what other things they've done. Well, this was a Friday afternoon. We were making some final selections and they, they were, of course, it's easy now, thanks to the work that you people have done, to find citations and to count them all up or to, you don't even need to count them, they're counted for you. So it's easy to do. On Saturday, I was reading some of the recent literature. I think this was in Science. A paper saying women in engineering publish in just as prestigious journals as the men, but they're cited less. So of course I had to read this. And you know the reason why? I think it, it makes sense. Women, particularly in engineering, tend to have smaller networks than men. And you normally cite the people that you know, that you work in the same area you do, or are people that are your, your, your friends in your network. Well, the next meeting of the Computing Science Selection Committee, I go back with this headline. I don't know that they were terribly impressed, but they, they, it, it helped to, to say, we've got to be careful. Here is something that we might never have thought about, although, as I say, it was causing me a little bit of discomfort. But it's looking, and I found if you're on a promotion committee, if you're uh, talking about the people that you should give performance reviews that, that, to or if they should get increments, I found that one of the ways to elicit some of these biases is to ask questions. Why did you put that person at the top rather than this one? And for me, it's quite exciting when somebody on the committee will say, oh, oh, yeah, no, maybe I didn't think about that as I made my selection or made my ranking. And it's often something that is to do with these subconscious biases. And it's far more important to try and get the person to see their own bias than it is to say you're biased. That doesn't get you anywhere, at least it doesn't get me anywhere because I have to work with these people again. And if they can discover for themselves that maybe there's something that, that, that biased them in their, their way of thinking, then that's, that's great. Um, the other thing I wanted to talk about here, oh yes, two things, holding discussions with female graduate students. That comes back 
to encouraging young women to look up, to, to think of careers in decision-making roles. The policies, parental leave, flexible work patterns and daycare. I haven't talked at all about, well, I did talk about women being mothers, but this is still one of the major things that causes women to take time out, sometimes even five years, and then find when they come back. Nowadays, they're so far behind in the technology, in, in what's been going on. And one of the important things here is to try and keep these people in the loop so that they feel as if they're still connected, rather than say goodbye, see you in a year or five years, depending on what happens. Keeping that line of communication open, that's so easy now. People can work from home. Facilitating mentorship. I'm delighted that the society has seen the importance of that, and I was very impressed with the session on Wednesday afternoon. And then looking at longer term strategies, always looking to see what is new in the work, what can we do. And let me just tell you a little bit about the Winsett Centre, the Canadian Centre for Women in Science, Engineering, Trades and Technology. I was hearing, that this is SETT, but I was hearing a different uh, definition of SET yesterday, and it's funny, whenever I hear SET, it's always science, engineering, technology, but there are other definitions of those three letters. Um, we look at action, and it's got to be based on need. Now, I've talked about some of the needs that we, we're recognizing, and so we, we are con continually asking people, what do you need? We're asking CEOs, what do you need? And what we've done Oh, I wanted to show you this, because I thought you might identify with some of this. When we have, and, and this is usually groups of women, and they're often asked, what are your issues and challenges? This is the list that we continually get. Negotiation. Do you enjoy negotiating? If you're like me, you certainly do not. Confidence. How to be assertive, and I talked about assertiveness. Promotion, how do I ask for it? How do I deal with the biases? How do I deal with cultural differences? We undersell ourselves. <laughs> An issue sometimes are toxic leaders. And we need allies and champions. That's a huge one. That's also got a lot to do with mentorship. You need somebody at the boardroom table who when the CEO says, Hmm, yeah, I think we, th this is the job that we, we want someone to fill. And somebody else says, oh, I know somebody who's good at that. And you need that kind of advocacy. Of course, it's wonderful if it's a woman. The actions, what we've done, are develop workshops based on these very things that the women keep telling us we need. And these are, um, you've seen on communication and negotiation, but the one that I'm excited about is this last one, creating respective and inclusive workplaces for executives and administrators. And one of the most rewarding things, this is a fairly new workshop that we've put in place. A group of social science researchers were following up with the people who took the first workshop to see if it really had any, made any difference. And after six months, one of the team leaders who took this workshop said to the researchers, yes, I've, I've taken action. I kept saying, well, there's no women in my team. And this is, again, an engineering consulting company. And, well, so what? No women want to apply. They, they don't apply, so I can't do anything about it. And he said, I realized, of course, I could do something about it. I could go and look for women who might be interested in being on my team. And I've done that, and I've got a woman on my team. That made the company happy. It made us very happy. That's what we want. We want people to actually do something that will make a difference. And I wanted to share with you the importance of mentorship. And this is mentorship that changes not so much your knowledge of a system or a culture, or, well, of a system or, or technology, 
but changes the way you think. Chrissy Miller was in her last year of teaching when I was at Edinburgh University. She was profoundly deaf and she wore a great big box a long time ago, so there weren't small hearing aids at that time. And it was a chemistry experiment gone wrong that made her so deaf. And we were quite convinced that she could hear more than she let on, <laughs> but, but she expected a great deal of us as students. And I remember times when I did not appreciate that one bit. I thought her expectations are just, she's just expected too much. But she provided the tools, the information, the support to help us to meet her expectations. That's a lesson I have learned. I have high expectations of what you as a society are going to do to change the situation, of what my students will be able to do, because we know that people respond to expectations. And if you expect a lot, you're much more likely to get it. Gordon Kaplan was my advocate at the boardroom table, and <laughs> Bruce Danchik, who's here, who was uh, in the provost's office at the University of Alberta, would remember Gordon Kaplan, and he is my mentor. I'm, he started wisest and got me then to take it over. And uh, advocacy at the decision-making table. And then Ursula Franklin, professor of materials engineering at the University of Toronto, who has a totally different philosophy and has shaped mine. And I'm so grateful for it. I would sit at her feet. She's now well into her 90s. But I, she still has the wisdom that is quite remarkable. Meeting people like that, having those people. And I wouldn't have called any of these people as my mentor. It's only looking back, I realize what an influence they had on me. And of course, my mother. My mother was a teacher. And she showed me in strange ways that she believed in me. Tell you a quick story. She, was a, she had a school for children with learning disabilities. And I was at Edinburgh University. Uh, we had final exams, which everything depended on them. They, they, you didn't get exams as you went along. There was a final, and that was that. And I was feeling very sorry for myself. I think it was organic chemistry or something of that kind. And I said to my mother, you spend more time with your children at school than you do with me. She really was a very committed to the children in, in her school. And do you know what her response was? Yes, they need me more. Now that was no comfort to me at the time. <laughs> but I have realized what she was telling me was, I believe in you, you can do it. You don't need me. Thanks, Mum. That was a great gift. The ultimate goals. Women reach their full potential in the workplace. There's an increase in women in leadership roles, and you probably can guess, I want to see the culture change that happens when both women and men work together in leadership roles. Workplaces become inclusive and respectful of all employees. I keep thinking that's happening, then I hear a story, and I realize, no, we're not quite there yet. What are the measures of success? Growing diversity, buy-in of all employees for the need for diversity, a recognition of its importance. Top executives champion diversity and inclusion, that's essential. And there are many companies now where that's happening. Engagement in the company's diversity and inclusion programs, education leading to action. Let me say again, Delighted to see that the society had a series of educational seminars before the, the conference started. Maybe looking at some of the kinds of workshops to encourage women into the leadership roles would be something that could be included in these leadership seminars. Policies which sustain diversity and are implemented. That's a really important one. And then 
something that we again hope will happen, that reasons for leaving expressed at exit interviews change. It's not that it was a toxic workplace or that I couldn't take it anymore. Thank you very much.